Ladies and gentlemen, don't knows and undecided. Come closer. Closer still. That's it. Greetings. Salutations. Bonjour. Welcome in. Buenas noches. Konnichiwa. Shalom. And indeed, Eochuk. Thank you, my friends, for braving the elements to join me on this most darksome and, dare I say it, caliginous of nights. You are about to embark on a perilous journey, my friends, a journey fraught with horrors, a journey that will transport you from the world you know or think you know into a shadowy realm of terror, mystery and dread, a secret citadel that is hidden just be... Sorry? Yes, yes, this is the ghost wall. Yes, yes, you've come to the right place. What's that? No, this isn't that ghost walk. No, no, I'm not Lester de la Pour. This is the original city ghost walk. I've been doing this a lot longer than that flyby. Wait, where are you going? Hold up a minute. What's that? Well, don't believe everything you read on TripAdvisor. I mean, some of those reviews were just malicious, made up, people trying to put me out of... Trust me, you won't enjoy Lester's tour. No, all gimmicks and no substance. And he copied the stovepipe hat off me. Wait! Bloody hell. Please yourselves, then. FYI, he tries to do a stupid jump scare at the end. Well, spoiler alert, it comes out at you from behind the gravestone, and it isn't a Victorian ghost child. His name's Dave, and he's just a midget in a dress. What's that? We don't call them midgets anymore. What do we call them, then? Little people. Because that's what their community prefers to be called. Jesus, when did everything start becoming a community? But what? what? Not you as... Don't you leave! Reporting me for hate speech? Oh, for... F Fair lady. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. I was just dealing with these t time wasters. It happens a lot these days. Are you here for the ghost walk? My ghost walk, not the other one. The original city ghost walk with Charles Crowley. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, it's nice to know that some people still have taste. And I want you to know that just because there's only one of you, you'll still be getting the full experience. In fact, you're getting something better, really. More personalised, more... intimate. Yes. Well then, my dear, before we commence our crepuscular peregrination into the tenebrous substratum of this haunted, story city, I must first solicit from your good person remuneration to the, to my mind, very reasonable tune of fifteen English pounds. Fifteen quid, yes. No, the website's wrong. I, I keep meaning to update it. Yes, I can do contactless. Now, hang on. Here we are. Just needs to connect. Do -do 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 -do. Sometimes just takes a while to warm up. As the Eskimo said to the are you local? Oh, visiting. Travelling alone, no? <laughs> I don't know why I'm surprised. Girls, young women, I mean, are so much more independent these days. More liberated, and that's a good thing. So much freedom to experiment and discover yourself. Find out what you're into, you know. Explore. Ah, here we go. That's gone through now. Very good. It will show up on your statement as Ghost Crow, by the way. And now, let us tarry no longer. Stay close at my heel, fair lady. For phantoms, fiends and demons lie in wait for us. Eldritch ghouls will dog us each step of the way. But if we stick together, I think we'll be okay. Follow me! And mind the curb there. That's it. An insurance thing. Come on, let's go!
Ghost Walk by Jasper Lestrange. Right then, we have arrived at our first stop, and those keen and dare I say it, pretty eyes of yours will have already ascertained that we are at a public house. Mm. One of several we will call at on our tour. Saloons, inns, taverns. We call them haunts, don't we? Why are there always ghosts in pubs? Not just because they're full of spirits. This pub, the Lamb and Flag, is a very old pub, dating back to 1622. Rumour has it that there is a pickled egg in the jar on the counter that's at least as old. But a pub that old is bound to have its fair share of ghosts. Regulars have been known to raise a glass to the hanged highwayman who is sometimes seen propping up the bar, the rope marks visible on his broken neck, his head lolling horribly. And several bar staff over the years have refused to go down to the cellar lest they face again the ghostly battalion of Roman soldiers who have been known to march through the walls. But there is another, more dreadful and pitiful tale to recount. The story of an apparition that even some committed teetotalists have seen. The ghost of Jenny Berrycloth. Imagine, if you can, this same street in the autumn of 1897. Queen Victoria is still on the throne. There is a growing prosperity in the land, and the city's music halls and theatres are packed to the rafters. It is in that autumn that an actor of some repute, a Mr. William Honey, performing at the nearby Royal Theatre in a touring production of the Victorian melodrama The Second Mrs. Davenport, sought lodgings at the very establishment we find ourselves without. Indeed, found accommodation in the fourth story room above us, the window of which overlooks this street. Imagine the debonair Mr. Honey standing at the window now. He's looking out of the window perhaps with a vaguely imperious air of the people below, his public, his audience. A handsome fellow, yes, well suited to play the lead part in a somewhat torrid story of romantic intrigue, adultery, and <clears throat> axoricide. See him, and now imagine the impression a man like that would make on a young chambermaid, just seventeen years old, seventeen and not yet wise about the ways of men. Can you imagine? Probably she harboured a lot of quaint romantic notions herself, thought that Mr. Honey, even his name was sweet, meant every one of the compliments and promises he poured in her ear. Imagine his plea. It can be very lonely going from town to town as we in the theatre do. Stay a while with me in my room. Oh, imagine the thrill in her young heart as she surrendered to those impassioned entreaties. Her, humble little Jenny Berrycloth, the object of this handsome man's desire. Imagine being so innocent, so naive. You can see it now, can't you? Jenny stood in front of the mirror above the dressing table. Honey behind her, telling her how beautiful she is. She sees his handsome reflection in the glass, a charming smile, his hand as it moves from her shoulder to her head, her hair as it comes undone. He had his wicked way with her, and afterwards when he left, he didn't write, Imagine the pain of realisation, the shame, the ignominy. But worse than that, Jenny was pregnant with Honey's child. She was at a complete loss about what to do. She could not face telling her devout Christian parents. So she wrote a desperate letter to the actor, to which, he, of course, he did not reply. In the end, she took her savings and bought a train ticket to Stockport, where the second Mrs. Davenport had just started its run. 
she would confront William Honey in person and appeal to his better nature, implore him to make an honest woman of her. We have no record of the conversation that took place between them, but have reason to believe he was quite terse with her, if not abjectly cruel. Broken, desolate, she nevertheless returned home and continued to carry out her duties as chambermaid in the lodging rooms of the Lamb Flag. We can't know what finally drove her to do what she did. Perhaps returning every day to that room to make the bed that she had lain in, the bed in which Honey had taken wanton advantage of her. Perhaps it was all too much to stand. Well, having grown concerned about her whereabouts, and thinking he had heard a violent crash, landlord Mr. George Murray went upstairs to see what was going on. He went to that room on the fourth floor last. Though he was, by all accounts, a stoical sort of fellow, the shriek he made was heard in the bar downstairs and sent his wife Agnes dashing up to join him. And there on the bed, the scene of that fatal seduction, was Jenny Berrycloth. The bedclothes, Jenny's clothes, everything was awash with blood. She had evidently broken the mirror. Perhaps she had seen Honey's reflection there. Who knows, but she took one of the ragged shards of glass and... Well, you can imagine. For a time, the landlord of the Lamb and Flag wouldn't let anyone stay in the room on the fourth floor. He didn't care to go in it himself. But time passes. The place changed hands. It was in the early 1930s, between the wars. A terrible night, they say, one of the worst anyone could remember. You've heard of sheets of rain. Well, it was absolutely sheeting down that night. A real frog strangler, as our Texan cousins might say. There was this chap, a music hall performer, a fellow called Richard Fetch, who told jokes under the name of Dickie Winkle. He'd gone into the pub, seeking refuge from the weather, had become excessively refreshed, and as the rain showed no sign of letting up, asked whether he could avail himself of a room. The current landlord, a Mr. Gordon Lowndes, who liked to pour himself one whenever he poured one for a customer, and as such, had grown a little tipsy as the evening wore on, said he had only one room free. When his wife reminded him that they didn't put guests up in that room because, and she whispered it in his ear, when she reminded him, he said it was stuff and nonsense, and at any rate he couldn't in all good conscience send a chap out into that filthy night when there was a perfectly good bedroom at his disposal, and certainly not on account of some ridiculous ghost story. I don't know if Richard heard that last part, or if it would have made any difference. He was sleepy. I'm glad of a bed for the night. The landlord took the fellow up the stairs, showed him to his room. They would have the door open to air it every now and then, but it had that fustiness unoccupied rooms have. Not that Richard would have cared or noticed. Two men said their good nights to one another, and the comedian, who was now dog tired, made some half hearted attempts at getting undressed. I think he got as far as taking his shoes off, struggled to hang his jacket on the back of the chair, ended up letting it drop on the floor. The bed was calling to him, so he just wanted to climb beneath the sheets. Well, he was asleep almost the moment his head hit the pillow, God bless him. It can only have been about half an hour or so later, when he became gradually aware of something or someone. Yes, he felt there was someone beside him in the bed. It was dark, of course. The street lamp outside was letting a little light in through a gap in the curtain, just enough to illuminate a patch of the floor, the foot of the bed, and part of the wall where 
the mirror was hung. But otherwise it was dark, and he didn't immediately turn to look anyway. He just kept lying there. He could feel a soft breath on the back of his neck almost detect the gentle brush of delicate lips against his skin. What was that? Were slender fingers trailing down his neck toward the parting in his shirt, making the hair on his chest bristle with anticipation. Inebriated he may have been, he was not insensible and by no means incapacitated. Perhaps he was dreaming of a sweetheart in another town or city. Perhaps he thought the landlady, or maybe even the landlord, had decided to keep him company. Stranger things have happened, and for the itinerant, any temporary respite from loneliness must be grasped, as it were, with both hands. He rolled over in bed, half expecting to see the face of this nocturnal visitant, the one whose tender ministrations had roused him so. And he saw... nothing. Whatever he had felt, or thought he had felt, he was alone, quite alone. And yet, he heard something then. He heard sobbing. A woman crying. He couldn't place it to any one spot in the room. It sounded like it came from all around. It was the sound of utter devastation. Who's there? He said, trembling. His voice was sharp, so loud and clear that it seemed to have broken a silence which suggested to him that the sound of crying must, after all, have been a figment of his imagination. Either way, it ceased the moment he spoke, leaving just that silence and the echo of his question. His mouth was dry. His head throbbed. He was ready to attribute this bout of nerves to the alcohol he had consumed that evening, and had already begun muttering the usual tepid assurances to himself that another drop must never pass his lips. When... There was a sudden violent explosion of glass. The mirror shattered, as if struck by a hammer. The empty frame slid down the wall, landing with a crash. Richard sat up. In fact, he practically shot up in the air. His eyes bulged. A cloud of glass dust twinkled, caught in that small light through the window. Well, the poor fellow's heart was pounding now. He reached over to the bedside table to switch a lamp on or something. Of course, the room wasn't really kitted out for guests. Not that he could have known anything about that. There was no lamp. So he turned then to see if there was one on the other side. And and that's when he saw her, the former chambermaid of the old lamb and flag, poor Jenny Berrycloth. When they did finally get the man's story out of him, he said he had turned to find a woman there in the bed beside him, her body writhing, shrouded in some kind of black robe, he said. It must surely have been her white apron, stained dark red. Her right hand was repeatedly rising and falling on her breast and stomach, as if she was beating herself, he said. At first, he didn't notice the jagged shard of glass she held, the awful silver blade she clutched so tightly it tore into her fingers and palm with each stroke. He didn't notice it because he had already seen something far worse. The ragged hull that yawned in her neck, the gaping wound, 
that seemed to grow wider every time her head twisted on the pillow and emanating from it an awful whistling sound. As I said, it was much later when all that came out. He bolted out of the place, you see. Didn't even put his shoes back on. Oh, she's been seen many times since. Multiple times, by multiple eyes, but not usually in such violent circumstances. It seems, and I have this on good authority, that the ghost of Jenny Bellicloth reserves her most gruesome manifestations for those of a theatrical persuasion. Now, I am far too modest and unassuming to call this ghost tour theatre, but it may be classified as a minor, generally unprofitable branch of the business of show. Take a look up at that window, my dear, and who knows what you might see? Keep looking. Keep, keep looking. Right. What's that, my dear? Why? I just meant in case the ghost of Jenny Berrycloth decided to put in an appear. Why did I tell the story? Well, this is the ghost walk. I asked you at the start if you were sure you'd come to the right place. Oh, you think I was enjoying it too much? Well, I suppose I do rather relish the telling of the tale. Salacious. Oh, I get it. You think I'm making light of a tragedy? <sighs> yes, it was pretty rotten luck for Jenny, wasn't it? And yes, the olden days were jolly unfair, weren't they? Before we move on to our next stop, I shall issue the following disclaimer. I, Charles Crowley, am thoroughly against all bad things that happened in the past, and describe the historical events on this tour not for entertainment purposes, but as an opportunity for sober reflection. Any expression of joy or amusement on my behalf is entirely coincidental, and rest assured... Every night I cry myself to sleep over the misfortunes endured by people I have never met after first soundly flagellating myself as penitents for my non-existent participation in their misery. And now, with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, my good lady, let us make haste! Onwards, ever onwards! And if you excuse me while we walk, I just need to make a quick telephone call. Bloody hell were you? I hope you weren't downstairs in the bar again. You'd better be at the next stopping point, or there'll be bloody hell to pay. Ah, here we are. Just uh, need to send a text. Let's see. Right, gather in, all one of you. Good. So, you might be wondering why we have stopped here, outside this handsome but otherwise unobtrusive Georgian townhouse. Now, as indicated by the sign, it serves as the office for a firm of chartered surveyors. But back in 1922, it was the residence of a certain Mr. Oswell Strake, an eminent businessman, no less, who had accrued considerable wealth from investments scattered across the British Empire. To tut, naughty empire, and who dwelt here in this house with his wife, Dorothy. Dorothy was some years older than her husband and independently wealthy, and there were unkind rumours that Strake had married her for mercenary reasons, but they were a well-respected couple. The problems began when Mrs. Strake suddenly fell sick. Dorothy, my love, I'm so worried about you, said Mr. Strake, and especially when I'm working and I can't be near to you. I really think you need someone to be with you all the time, to attend to you. Mrs. Strake was a stoic by nature. No, I won't hear of it, she said. 
I couldn't have some stranger fussing about me all the time. I should rather die. Her husband winced. Dorothy, please don't talk like that. You know it upsets me when you talk about dying. Well, I'm not getting any better, am I? This illness is so strange. And while you may have gotten used to everyone around you worrying about your wants and needs, I'm not sure death will worry over much about how upset you are. <laughs> yes, you're right as always, my darling. But what if it wasn't a stranger attending to you? What do you mean? Your sister. But Fanny has her own life in London. She wouldn't just give it all up to... On the contrary, I've already asked her. She's arriving this weekend. Does that make you happy, darling? Well, of course, said Mrs. Strait. But darling, won't you find it terribly bothersome, having two of us Worthington women under one roof? Well, oh, I can always lock myself in my study if it gets too much to bear. Anything to... Help you get better, my love. And so it was that Mrs. Strake's sister, Fanny Worthington, came to live with them at the house. For a week or so, it was a very agreeable arrangement for everyone concerned. Until one day. Fanny. Yes, Dorothy. It's possible I'm just tired again, but have you... Since you've been here, heard anything strange in the night? Strange? No, I don't think so. Why do you ask? Oh, it's probably nothing, as I say. Perhaps it's the new medication Dr. Armitage prescribed for me. It's just these last few nights I keep waking and hearing things. What sort of things? Oh, at first it was scratching and moving about. A mouse, perhaps? No, no, not mouse-like. Not that kind of sound at all. Dotty, I've never seen you like this before. You're normally so strong. It was always me who was the skittish one. The weak one. Oh, it's this beastly illness. I really don't feel quite myself. I don't think I'm imagining things. Last night, whatever it was, spoke. Spoke? What do you mean? Could it have been someone outside? No, it was closer than that. It was here, in this room. Well, who then? What did they say? It was a woman's voice. She said, Betrayal. Dotty, you're starting to worry me. Should I call for Dr. Armitage? No. I mean, yes. I mean, I don't know. I think there was something, someone, here last night. It was probably a dream, Dotty. Fanny, I would have thought that myself. Except that wasn't all that happened. Do you mean? And when she had heard everything that her sister had to relate, Fanny went immediately to see Mr. Strake in his study. I can't go on with this, Oswell, she said. I really can't. Something is not right. What's the matter, Fanny? You look as if you've seen a ghost. I haven't. But she has. She said a woman appeared in her room last night. She saw her. At the foot of the bed. Darling. This is just a sign that our plan is working. And working rather better than we'd hoped. Medicine and what you've been doing these past few nights. It's starting to fray her nerves. 
But that's just it, Oswell. I did the scratching and knocking, like you said, but I never spoke. And I certainly didn't crawl to the end of the bed wearing a shabby old dress. That's what she said, Oswell. It was a woman. Or something that had once been a woman. And it crawled through the door and along the floor to the bed, this emaciated figure, shrouded in damp rags, black hair, hanging in lank, grimy tendrils, the face glimpsed between the parting in that foul curtain, rotten in parts, in parts nothing more than white bone. She's losing her mind, Fanny. Whatever she thinks she heard or saw, it was in her head, and when she starts telling Armitage about these funny noises and phantom women, he'll see straight away what the matter is. They'll have no choice but to put her away, and then we can be together, just like we were in London. Do you remember? Oh, yes. Of course I do, but... Well, then, there's really nothing more to talk about, is there? But she... It... Said... Betrayal. But what if she knows, Oswell? What you told me about her, darling. The way she treated you when you were children. How she made you feel. And let some misguided sense of loyalty sway you now. It's all for the best, Freddy. You'll see. Yes, the illicit lovers decided to press on with their devious plan to send Dotty. Well, Dotty. Fanny would creep around in the room next door to her sisters, scratching and banging about, trying to create the impression that a phantom was at rest. But all the time she began to feel that the house was haunted by a real phantom. Haunted by the same spectre her sister had reported. And then, one night. Good night, sister. I have prepared a sleeping draught for you. I pray your rest tonight is untroubled. Fanny. Yes, Dotty. Please keep with me tonight. I'm sorry. Sleep with me. Like we used to when we were little. I promise I'll keep my cold toes to myself. I, I don't know if. Please. I'll sleep better knowing your clothes. Uh, I suppose. And that's how Fanny Worthington ended up sharing a bed with her sister, Dorothy Strake, on that cold winter's night in 1922. Fanny. Yes? You know what you said the other day? No, what did I say? That I was always the strong one, and you were weak. Did I say that? Yes, and I want you to know that I never thought that. It's all right, Noddy. No, you should know that it was quite the opposite, really. I was jealous of you, of how pretty and vivacious you were. Precocious, you mean. Don't be silly. Well, maybe a bit. But remember how our relatives and friends, even our parents, always fussed around you, made you the centre of everything. It wasn't because you needed coddling or anything. It was because they needed it. They needed you to smile at them and laugh at them, because that was always your gift. You always smiled at people and made them feel special. Whereas I, I was cold and difficult. You were at the centre of everything, and I was pushed to the outside. That's why I was sometimes beastly to you. Don't say anything. I know I was. It wasn't because you were weak. It was because I was. I needed you to make me feel strong. Dotty. No, shh. Don't 
don't say anything. I was weak and I needed you to make me feel strong. Just like you're doing now. I feel much safer knowing you're here with me. Good night, Fanny. Good night, Dotty. Fanny. Yes? You like Oswell, don't you? Like? What? You get on well with him. Oh, I know he can be a bit stiff, but he has a good heart, really. Promise me you'll look after him when I'm gone. Dotty, you're not going to die. Well, everyone does. And it's highly unlikely that I should be the one to buck that trend. Just say you will. You don't have to marry him or anything. Just keep an eye on him. For me. Yes, I... I will. Good night, Dotty. Good night, sister. What? No, it doesn't end there. I was pausing for dramatic effect and... To have a swig of this. Care for some? No, you youngsters all drink bubble tea and do baking now, don't you? But please yourself. Well, the two sisters both fell asleep, but Fanny was restless. Outside a chill wind was blowing, fingers of rain tapped against the glass like fingers fingering, and Fanny was suddenly awake, alert to something. Hello? Is there... is there someone there? Fanny? Oswell? Is she asleep yet? I've been waiting for you in the study. Go away. I can't tonight. Go to bed. But, but, Fanny, my darling, I'm in a state of profound discomposure. Look at some of your etchings. Oh, Fanny, how I long for you. You drive me wild with concupiscence, you fabulous creature, but... This confounded interval of forced abnegation is almost too much for a red-blooded man to endure. I'll be in the study with my waterhouse if you change your mind, my love. Good night, Oswell. Good night, sweet Fanny. Oswell. Oswell. Go away. Oswell, I told you before. Fuck. You've betrayed your sister. Like I was betrayed. You must leave this house. Leave it. Get out. Get out. Oh my goodness! Get away from me! Fanny, I... <coughs> Fanny Worthington fell down the stairs, having been surprised by Oswell Strake suddenly stepping out of the shadows. She broke her neck and died instantly. You may be wondering who this mysterious spectre was, this woman who gave the appearance of having dragged herself from a stagnant pool 
Emerald Bark. History tells us that she was the murdered, drowned wife of another unfaithful husband, former tenant of the house. This wronged woman apparently considered it her mission from beyond the grave to warn Dorothy Strake of her husband's infidelity with her sister. In many ways, I suppose, this phantom proved to be more of a sister than Fanny ever was. Am I right, sister? What's the matter? Why are you looking at me like that? You think Strake got off lightly? Well, that's debatable, isn't it? I mean, he wanted Fanny and ended up stuck with the old ball and chain, who, for all we know, really was a bit of a cow. Oh, you can bet she made a complete recovery and ended up outliving the poor blighter. Probably made the rest of his life a misery. He was as culpable as the sister. He deserved punishment. Good heavens, what is it with you youngsters? Always so self-righteous. It must be exhausting going through life with such moral certitude. Casting everyone as either a hero or a villain in some great cosmic morality play. Whatever happened to be kind? Your generation finds it alarmingly easy to excuse its own degeneracy, but seeks retribution for things that happened decades ago, usually based on whatever transgressions from the ever-expanding smorgasbord of iniquities it's currently fashionable to be outraged about. But don't get me on my hobby horse, or we'll be here all night. We have plenty more ghosts to see. Or not to see, as it happens. Excuse me, I just need to make another phone call. Ted! You were supposed to jump out of the alley dressed as the bog woman. I suppose you've had a right skin full by now and you're on your back somewhere. Either that or you've gone to see your friends at the Happy Ending Spa. Well, I hope it was worth it, Ted, because next time I see you, we're going to have to have a serious talk about your future on this ghost walk. On this planet. Now, some of us have got work to do. Right. Off we go, young lady. To the scene of our next haunting. And from out of the chest, a ghostly finger would beckon. Andale, andale. Could still smell the tobacco smoke from that old meerschaum pipe. Andale, andale. Melted snow on the writing desk. But it hadn't been snowing. Andale, andale. In the locked room upstairs, a skeleton and a silver mask hanging on the door. Andale, andale. No, said the landlord. No, not a Mexican prostitute. But there was. A carpet fitter. Um, beg pardon? Why haven't I told the story of the Grey Lady? Well, who wants to hear that? I mean, it's such an oft-told tale. Good gracious, if you want that kind of rot, you should have done Lester's tour. That old ham would really have made a meal of it. Me? It's just not a story I care for, that's all. But since we're near the spot where it happened... Very well. It was back in the 1800s. There was a poor farm girl. Susan Bennett. She was... What are we meant to call deaf and dumb now? Ah, deaf mute. Yes, well, she was one of them. Bright girl, though, by all accounts. She'd learned to draw and paint very well. She would go wandering sometimes in the grounds of a nearby country estate because she liked to sketch the trees and flowers. It was a big house, owned by a retired army colonel, Edmund Gilstrap. 
He and his wife, Hortense, were unable to have children. Uh, I suppose that's why they both took a shine to young Susan. They would bump into her sometimes as they strolled along the many paths through the gardens, and she would always show them the pictures she had drawn. They became quite fond of her. Over time, these encounters lasted longer. They would sit together. Hortense even taught her to read and write using a little book of verse. Well, Susan lived on the farm with her aging father. He was very sick, had been for some time, Eventually he died. Not knowing quite what to do, and unable to manage the failing farm on her own, she first went to the Gilstraps. Unfortunately they were away that weekend, attending a wedding in the next county. I'm afraid the servant who spoke to Susan in their absence gave her rather short shrift. She had never seen the girl before, and found her speech hard to understand, so she sent her away, telling her she wasn't welcome, and not to come around begging again. Hurt and confused, Susan considered what to do next. She knew she had relatives in America, and hoped they might take her in and look after her. So she decided to pack her meagre belongings in a bag, and head into the city, where she planned to use what savings she had to buy a train ticket to Southampton, and from there board the next boat across the Atlantic. When they returned home, Colonel Gilstrap and his wife were handed a letter that had come through the door. It was one of Susan's flower pictures, and with it a note to say that her father had died and that she was leaving for America. Of course, the couple were shocked by the news. Susan had hardly ever been out of the village, let alone gone to the city on her own. Besides, if only she'd known, she was more than welcome to stay with them at the manor, because... For they had come to think of her as a daughter. Desperately, Colonel Gilstrap took a pony and trap, raced to the city, hoping he could find and catch her in time before she got to the train station. But poor Susan never made it to the station. She was here in this very square we stand in now. At midday, the place would have been teeming with people. All that hustle, bustle, noise. Although, of course, she would have been in her silent world. Imagine the little country girl, lost in the city she was unfamiliar with, disoriented, looking round, wide-eyed, people barging her out of the way and ignoring her requests for directions. Well, there was a horse and cart, delivering barrels of beer to the pub on the corner there. The Saracen's head, then... Weatherspoons now. Looking the wrong way, Susan stepped into its path, and, unable to hear the drayman's cries, to get out of the way, Colonel Gilstrap arrived in the square just in time to see a huge gathering outside the pub. Sensing something terrible had happened, he ran over to the spot and forced his way through the crowd. He saw her lying there on the ground. Blood was flowing in rivulets between the cobbles. He saw the body, mangled, horribly broken. And he saw her face, terror still showing in her wide-open eyes, the matted hair, the slack, dislocated jaw, hanging. Oh, God. Eh? No. Nothing. Well, that's the story of the Grey Lady of Old Market Square. Every so often, people still see her face in the crowd on busy days. A few weeks ago, a delivery rider came off his bike one night after swerving to avoid a pedestrian. A young girl in a grey dress, he said. When he looked up, there was no one there. Other people claim her ghost wanders the grounds at the old manor house. Funny that. You think a ghost can be in two places at once? I suppose so. What's that? You have a ghost story of your own. You want to show me something. Well, <laughs> the custom dictates that the tour guide is usually the one doing the guiding, but... 
Uh, hang on. Oh, wait. Where are you going? What are we doing here? It's just an old factory building. I'm not following you in there. I promise to make it worth my while. Well, this could be interesting. Hello? Where are you? Where did you go? Hello? Bloody marvellous. What the... Body bag. What a gurney. All right. Okay. What's... What's going on? I... I get it, you know. You're trying to put the willies at me. Scare the scarer. Well, congratulations, because I'm feeling pretty spooked right now. I suppose this is for one of your Tic Tac videos, is it? I know all about this. Is this going out live? Is it a twit stream or something? Ah, fair lady. What's this all about? Do I recognize you? No. I've never set eyes on you in my life. Ah, there's more of you. Look, if this is a mugging, I've, I've got nothing. I'm, you're wasting your time. You've picked the wrong guy. What is this? Do I remember the name Naomi Gates? Ah, yes, of course. Is that what this is about? It was in the newspaper. On the TV, it's not a secret. I served my time. You don't think I still think about it sometimes? Dream about it. Have nightmares about it. Tell the story. What's there to tell? You obviously know it already. Me and Ted. Done a few ghost walks that night. Made a bit of money. Business was good in those days. As we often did, we went to the pub, the Merchant's Arms. It's a Tesco Express now. We had a few drinks, then when it was time to call it a night, got back in the van. It was past midnight on a Tuesday. There was hardly anybody about, almost nothing on the roads. Look, Sometimes people just step out into the road, don't they? I mean, everyone made a big deal about us both being over the limit. Four times over the limit, yes. Two, three, four, I was counting. I, I mean, she should have been wearing a high vis. No one could have stopped in time. Panicked, that was all. One little mistake. Haven't you ever made one? Any of you? No, of course not. Virtuous. Behind your masks and hoodies, aren't you? I served my time. Half of it, yes, half of it. I mean, it was no picnic. And, and there was the driving ban. Yes. For two years, yes. Look, what do you want to hear? Sorry? Because, yes, I'm bloody sorry. I've been sorry every single day since it happened. So have you. I'm sorry, but who are you? No, I've told you, I don't reckon. Oh. Chloe. The older sister. Yes, I remember. You were meant to pick her up from her guitar lesson, but you were busy and you... Blamed yourself because if you'd given her a lift, she wouldn't have been out walking, and if she hadn't been out walking, you blamed yourself as much as me, I suppose. No, no, you, you just blamed me. And your mother, I remember she was heartbroken. Killed herself. 
listen. Not a day goes by when I don't regret what happened. But this, the bed, the body, the pictures. I don't need this visual stimuli. I replay it all in my head every day. What are you doing? Stay away from me. Step back. Don't... You won't get away with this. You paid by debit card, remember? They'll be able to track you down. It wasn't your card. Ted's card. What... What have you done? My God. What have you done? You... You killed him! Oh my god! What are you... What are you... Where are you taking me? No! No! no. I'm sorry. Please. Please, I'm sorry. It was an accident. If I could go back and change it... Please! You must believe me. Wait. Where are you? Are you still there? Have you gone? Right above us is the platform from which Charles Crowley fell to his death with the rope around his neck. They say sometimes late at night you can still hear the anguished cry, his flailing body falling through the air, the tightening of the rope and the snapping of the neck. But did he jump or was he pushed? I guess we'll never know. Poor old Charles, eh? He always did like a drop. <laughs> well, that concludes our ghost tour. The city's only ghost tour featuring a man in a stovepipe hat. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll agree it's been a scream. Remember to follow us on social media. Like and subscribe on YouTube, leave a kind review, and thank you kindly, madam. Thank you. No hard feelings, eh, old chap? You're immortal now. Come on, Dave, let's go. You have been listening to the Encrypted Horror Halloween Special, Ghost Walk, written, read, and produced by Jasper Nostrange. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you to everyone who has followed this show. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, Happy Halloween!